Anybody here got a computer? <laughs> or a phone? Or a thing that's connected to the network? Because if you do, be very afraid. <laughs> it's an interesting time that we live in. Uh, I spent some considerable amount of time in my last business life working at Microsoft, and cybercrime is something that large corporations have to take very, very seriously. And one of the things that uh, I learned in that framework of paying attention on a global scale is that evils in the cyber world fall into five categories. There's malicious mischief, there's crime, there's espionage, there's warfare, and there's terrorism. And there are three kinds of actors who play in this game. There are amateurs, and there are professionals, and there are governments. And so you're going to hear a conversation tonight that speaks to the broad and breadth of issues associated with that between Ray and Shaban. So this will be a fascinating conversation, I'm sure. So tonight, Ray will be speaking and working on his insights from his new book, The Digital Resilience. Is your company ready for the next cyber threat? Since 2014, Ray's been the chair of Red Seal, and prior to that, spent a lifetime at Venrock as the managing general partner in the investment community and doing a ton of work in the security space. Prior to that, it's on microsystems, and he's trained as a nuclear engineer. So he brings a lot of experience to this. And I'm very proud to say that he's deeply involved with the Computer History Museum and our Exponential Center, which is a really important center where we're focusing on issues associated with business and the venture community and business models and all of the opportunities that present in that world. Moderating tonight's program is Siobhan Gorman. She's a partner at the Washington, D.C. firm Brunswick Group, where she concentrates on crisis, cybercrime, public affairs, and media relations. She's got a terrific background studying national security and working as a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and the Baltimore Sun. So with that, I'll get off the stage and welcome Ray and Siobhan to the stage and begin the program. So thanks for coming. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, and I think we'll just kind of kick it off with a really easy question. You've, you've been in cybersecurity for a lot of years. Um, why is cybersecurity failing us? And are you responsible for it? Oh, I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> responsible for it. <laughs> well, why is it failing us? Well, it is and it isn't, but it is mostly failing us. And it's failing because we've not paid close enough attention to it. If you, let me spin back a little bit and talk about, you know, in the old days, malware was transferred on floppy disks. Some of you may remember what those things were. And uh, it was sort of, and if there was a hacker, it was some high school kid hacking into the system, and everybody remembers the movie War Games and all that. So it was, it was sort of a, a small attack surface, and the results weren't very interesting. They were sort of fun to brag about. Then we got into this thing called the Internet in a big way, and we went through this, we're in this digital transformation. And now anything with electricity in it has probably got an IP address. So the attack surface went up by orders of magnitude, just huge orders of magnitude, and it became interesting. It became interesting because suddenly the money appeared on the internet. And where there's money, there's bad guys. And so here we go. Uh, they're after anything to help extract money from uh, either using your identity or my identity, or actually getting on the SWIFT wire transfer system and stealing money directly. Whatever, it's become, it's become a very, very large problem. And then you want to pile on that social engineering. That's getting you or me or anybody here to do something they really don't want to do. You're clicking on that, that link that connects uh, to uh, a false uh, page, and uh, you're convinced you've got to put in your name and ID for Citibank or something like that, and suddenly your computer's taken over, and uh, life is dumb. So, uh, this transfer, so we are behind in really instituting good strategies. There's a lot of good products out there, but really good strategies to deal with that. And that's what I tried to focus with, with digital resilience. I'll put the book up here, a little advertisement. <laughs> there we go. Um, He'll be signing downstairs after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it's really about being resilient because I don't think we're failing because, well, I call it whack-a-mole. For 20 years, we whacked them all. Here's a threat, whack it. Here's a threat, whack it. That doesn't work anymore. The threats are everywhere. They're weird. They transform themselves. So it's about being resilient. That is being prepared for the attack. And we're not resilient now. I don't think so. Not mostly. 
Okay. Um, can, you, can you bring us up to speed a little bit on how you landed here in terms of the cybersecurity space? Sure. You know, it's, uh, I get that question a lot. How did I wind up in cybersecurity, particularly coming from nuclear engineering? And, uh, it, you know, uh, when I was at Venrock, uh, when the Internet happened, John Doerr made this comment about this is the biggest thing since anything in venture capital, and he was right. But I had done this little company called Spyglass based in Champaign, and Spyglass sold OEM software for browsers and, and web servers. And thing. You remember Mosaic was uh, very popular. We had that product, and, and Spyglass went public very quickly because our, our, our revenues were up and to the right. So a life was good. Uh, um, and, but from that perch, uh, you could see that if this was truly new real estate, uh, then there would be lots of things to come along. Security. Think checkpoint software, the first deal I did in cybersecurity. Think advertising. Think double click. I did that. Uh, search, Lycos, we did that. Uh, think uh, commerce, we did this thing called global sports. All of these things went public very quickly. And so, seven, seven IPOs later, uh, our strategy had worked, and here we are. And over the course of Venrock, I did 53 deals, 15 of which were cyber related. So, I kind of naturally gravitated to it. I, I think really it's because it's kind of a hidden problem, and that's the same thing with nuclear science. You, 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 it's about what you can't see, but you got to infer. Same thing with resilience. Interesting. So are companies and governments doing cybersecurity wrong? You're talking about resilience, but you also said there's a lot of good products out there. So what's, what's being done wrong? Can you diagnose the problem a little bit? Uh, well, it's to the whack-a-mole issue. Uh, large corporations have today 50 or 60 cyber products. And they're all designed to do a particular thing. Maybe it's to deal with a, a piece of malware. Maybe it's to detect uh, an abnormality or to see when you showed up on their guest network and you brought with you some malware or something. There's all these products out there. But what, what the problem with corporations, and I don't want to separate it from government. We can talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> is that corporations really view this as a cost center. And if you're a cost center in a corporation, it's a grudge buy. <laughs> Right? You want to spend as little as you can to meet whatever the minimums are. And one of the reasons why we're behind is that compliance and standards are kind of new to this cyber world, whereas they're very normal in the physical world. So these corporations have a, a plethora of products. They have only a few people. Their hair is on fire. They can't solve the problems as quickly. And they need to take a deep breath, step back, and think about what if we had a better strategy to deal with this cyber? Problem. What if, what if we really took, stop using, I mean, not stop using those products, but let's think about what our problem really is. What data do we have? Who wants that data? What does the threat look like? What does the competition want from me? These are the things I think that the board and, and the senior management need to think about before they go spending the next million or two million or three million on a product. That'll solve that little whack a mole today, but next year, it's irrelevant. Look at WannaCry, came and went, all in a matter of three months. Glad what about governments? What? what? Oh, about governments. governments. Governments have a different mission. Um, first of all, they don't have a bottom line. We're the taxpayers. We are the bottom line. But they can spend what they need to achieve their mission, whether it be military and defense or offense, whether it be the IRS and keeping our tax records safe. They have a different mission. And uh, in addition to that, the, the people that are making the cyber decisions in government typically are in those jobs longer. And because they know money is coming and they're in those jobs longer, they have time to put a strategy together that might work. And we have seen in, my, in our little company, Red Seal, uh, our government business is just going to the moon uh, because we've got these long-term programs where they're deploying our technology in a resilient manner. But the point is they have time and money, whereas in the corporations, it's a grudge buy and just, can I get rid of the next problem? Can I just stop the next problem? But even so, you had the Russians in the State Department for months. They were in the White House. Obviously, the Pentagon is no stranger yeah. to these kinds of things. Um, and, and defense contractors, who you would think would probably have a, a kind of a leg up on it, also face challenges. So what, what are they doing wrong? What are they doing wrong? Uh, well, they need to buy uh, you know, Red Seal. They need Seal. to buy the book. They need to buy the book. <laughs> they need to buy Red Seal. No, uh, they probably already have it. Um, it's, it's really, you know, look, nothing's perfect. Even the best, most powerful companies, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they have issues. Uh, but their issues don't necessarily make the front page news. But when the State Department gets a mustache painted on a, secretary, a female Secretary of State, for example, it's a big deal. So nothing is perfect, and, and they, they do have a hard time implementing. And by the way, the attack surface of the US government is immense. Uh, 
It's just, it's just huge. And then you throw in the fact that um, uh, there are transients, you know, uh, I've been to the White House a few times and, and, you know, you log in, you get on the network and they don't know what I'm carrying on my phone. No one checked it out. I even one time went through the, uh, the metal detector and the x-ray machine and all the Macs came out the other side. I grabbed one, another guy grabbed another. And uh, I got to the airport that night and I had his and he had mine. Uh, and he happened to be a chief of staff of the senator and I got a phone call the next day. So, uh, I mean, so what protections That's are That's a there? very personalized cybersecurity. Yeah, very, very. Uh, I have my phone number on my login, so. But, um, no, it, it, there's so much transient activity going on and the attack surface is getting big. Well, you know, we kind of hurt ourselves by deployment of all this fabric. We've got clouds going on, we've got the phones in our pocket that are part of the fabric now. And we just sort of pile on this problem and make the attack surface and make it intractable. And so we lose track of what the network looks like. We lose track of where the doors are. Okay, easier, easier issue. Uh, midterm elections are coming up. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> what, 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 is your, what is your greatest concern in that context? And is there, is there a way that our election system yeah. could be more resilient in the cyber arena? What would that look like? But first, start with what you're expecting. <laughs> I should, just my note, I, was, I said, Siobhan, this is a really hard question. <laughs> um, it is a really hard question. Look, it's, um, I, I think the, the thing that scares me the most is if a person of authority claims that an election has been thrown by cybersecurity. Because there's no way to know, really, at the end of the day. The forensics take forever. Uh, you, can't, you can't challenge that authority very well. Uh, that scares me. Um, cyber scares me too, but the fact that I can claim that there was a problem based on cyber, that, that creeps me out a little bit. Look, it's easy, it, 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 easy, uh, what do I know? It, one, hacking one voting machine is irrelevant. Hacking even a district's voting machines is irrelevant. Hacking a database that's accumulating that data, now it's getting interesting. And that's not hard to do. Uh, uh, MIT and Harvard, after each presidential election, they do this massive survey. They look at the technology. They validate whether the technology, it's, not, it's a cyber question. They validate whether or not the uh, elections were thrown based on technology threats. And they've done every one, including the last one, and it was clean as a whistle. There's a few voting machines that have troubles, but generally it's good. So I'm not worried about the backdoor cyber attack on our voting system. I'm worried about someone claiming that a winner isn't the winner because of a cyber attack. So how does resilience apply in that well, context? Well, you know, I think, uh, I think it's about experts, right? Um, we get a lot of information uh, about a particular incident. Let's take a car wreck. If you and I saw the same car wreck and you reported your thing to the police and I reported mine, they, it's the same car wreck, but we probably reported different facts and different views. So it seems to me that if there's a train wreck in the election thing, we have to have different sources that you and I, through critical thinking, can read and assess whether or not that claim by that authority figure is right or wrong, or do we believe it or not. Unfortunately, emotion gets in that, and other, but I think it's really about collection from many sources. That's resilience, many sources, being able to respond to the attack in a way that, that allows me to decide whether or not it's important or not. And I, that, I think it's a human thing more than it's a technology thing. That's a very hard question. I'm, it's going to be interesting the day after. Yeah. Well, so one of the other things that, that concerns me about uh, the election system uh, and just sort of the, is, is really more the process, right? And um, misinformation is one of the issues that has emerged. Um, I mean, you're reading articles about yeah. it all the time. This is a global issue, um, yeah. but certainly we're facing it in the United States. I'm just wondering, you know, if you start applying concepts of resilience to that, what does that look like? Does, does it apply? Well, I think it's kind of the same. If you see something that is concerning or it's a fact or a fake fact or whatever it is, you have to look at multiple sources to find out if, what's the truth. And we all have our favorite sources. I read, you know, the R stuff and the D stuff all the time because I want to know what both sides are thinking about a particular incident. Um, it's, it's, you know, misinformation actually is, it's been around as long as mankind's been around. Ben Franklin used it in the Revolutionary War against our, against our enemies and with our friends. Uh, he convinced the French to do things they probably wouldn't have done otherwise. Uh, so misinformation is, and he was a big authority figure, right? An ambassador to France at the time. 
So uh, it, it can be useful. It can also be treacherous. And I think we just have to stop and think and not react to just the first thing we see about a particular thing. Um, and you can you do that on Twitter all the time. You, you stop and think. Uh, not you personally, I'm just... Gonna... No, I, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one, one other issue that actually came up when we were talking a little bit, um, a little bit earlier yeah. bef before the event, um, you know, just in terms of other issues that we're facing, um, as technology sort of advances and, and, and continues to develop, um, we're going to see things like autonomous vehicles, autonomous, you know, cars, planes, et cetera. Um, what concerns you from a cybersecurity standpoint in that sort of future, but not terribly distant future world? Well, autonomous vehicles, are, from a cybersecurity point of view, clearly they have to be um, well secured from a firewall, keep stuff out. They also have to have detection systems. They have to have voting systems in them. Uh, back in my nuclear days, we designed circuits with voting, voting capabilities so that even if something was a bad piece of information, if three other good pieces of information would override it and make a good decision. I'm sure that a lot of that is in there in the AI and stuff. But from a cyber security point of view, what if you could feed, what if you could feed the car a bad map? It's reached out, grabbed a map, and it's taking you to San Francisco airport, but it took you south. They misdirected the, the car. Uh, what if you... Uh, uh, what's the scene from Die Hard, right? When uh, the airplane, uh, those guys made the, the altimeter think it was 200 feet above, but it was 200 feet underground, and they crashed. I mean, those are the kinds of things that you can do to these automated systems if they're not sufficiently protected. And I, and I suspect that we'll need to, I don't know, a way to do it uh, in, in the ransomware world, you, you, you flush your equipment. If you have a ransom event, you just wipe the machine and start over. I think maybe the cars and anything automated about our life Healthcare systems in a hospital room maybe need to be flushed every now and then to prevent something that's in there from raising its ugly head and doing something mean. That, that may be a standard rigor in the future. It's not like our laptop where if we update it, update it, update it, update it, update it, and eventually it, it'll be okay. But you can refresh the entire software in an automated device like an airplane, a drone, or a medical device, I would think. That would help. Yeah. Um, I don't have a good strategy there, but yeah. that's what I would do. Yeah. I kind of um, want to, when I get checked into a hospital room, I say, I want to see the certification on these things, right? Because uh, I've been in hospital rooms and my phone talks to a lot. I open up the browser and there's a bunch of stuff you see. <laughs> it's not me. Right. <laughs> it's not like the expert. Yeah. Um, but what, well, I mean, you, as you bring it up, I mean, what, where do you think the, the healthcare sort of industry needs to be focusing the most when it comes to cybersecurity? Well, they need to, they need to write code that's pretty secure, and there's automated systems to do that and check. check Is that happening? That. I think so more now than it used to be. Uh, I wish in college uh, curriculum that they would teach better code writing. There's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, I'm not an expert at it, and I haven't checked recently, but there's, there are ways to check code for vulnerabilities, and I would hope that they're doing that. Unfortunately, again, it's about the grudge, right? You want to make this low-cost device as cheap as possible, so you're not going to spend a lot of time checking it to make sure it's, it's perfect, um, but we should. We should have, this, this is where government comes in with compliance, right? We have UL on all our, like our washing machine dryers and stuff. We ought to have a UL for software. You, you know, a phone I carry, it ought to be checked. You know, I'd be able to check often. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, that I thought was interesting about sort of your, your discussion of resilience in the cyber context is that um, I spent a lot of years covering terrorism and, 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 you know, that whole world. And obviously resilience was a key concept there. I'm just wondering sort of how... You, you take that and you apply it to ones and zeros. If you can kind of talk us through maybe some examples of where that applies the most and is kind of the most relevant in the, the kind of cyber or digital space. In the terrorist space and so forth. So it is about ones and zeros. Well, it doesn't have zeros. to be cyber terrorism. But no, just but, to, yeah. Well, ones and zeros. Look, um, um, it is a uh, ones and zeros, you mean digital. Uh, surely I could uh, hijack things. I can hijack weapons. In fact, this recent scare with Supermicro, right, the Bloomberg article about the Chinese chip that's on board, that's to be resolved. Uh, there's a great book out called uh, uh, Ghost Fleet, 
uh, that was published last Former year. Former colleague of mine wrote that. Wrote really? That. Yeah, oh, August Paul. Okay. It's a great book. Uh, 2022, uh, there, all our chips have sleeper code in it, and the code is activated, and it disables all our electronics, and then the Chinese attack us in Pearl Harbor, interestingly. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those page turners. I won't tell you how it ends. You can go get the book. It's a good book. It's a good book. Uh, but it, it suggests that it is a war of zeros and ones, or at least you can start the war with zeros and ones. This ends on a purely kinetic basis. But one, zeros and ones are, are, are very important. Look, the DNC hack in the last election. That's all about zeros and ones. And then once you had it, you could use that information and spread it around. Um, uh, wanna cry, uh, a zero and one attack. Uh, a, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think the... Uh, um, Oh, the attack where you flush all the web servers and you shut them down. Uh, the wiper virus? Yeah, those kinds of things. Uh, those are all, you know, attack. Uh, and what you do is you create doubt in the people that are on it. Uh, you create confusion in, in the people. You know, communication is the number one thing any emergency planning people would tell you. And if you disrupt that communication, you blow it up. So the zeros and ones is all about that disruption. And um, I, just the examples are, are many. Uh, what do we need to be doing so that we're prepared to bounce back from something like that? Well, and ransomware is a classic one. You need to have backups. If you don't have backups, you're crazy. Uh, I was at a dinner party recently, and a, a, a woman there uh, was, she, we were talking cyber, and she said, well, I had a ransomware, you know, somebody, and I called the number, and I sent them the $250, and nothing that. happened. Uh, and I asked her if she had a backup, and she said, what's a backup? Uh, so that was a teachable moment. A teachable moment, definitely. <laughs> it's too bad. Uh, but anyway, th you know, th there's, there's a lot of education, and we've, we've absorbed this technology very quickly. So um, uh, ransomware is, is a classic one where the recovery, the resilience is to have backups so that you can quickly swap things out. That's true for cars, airplanes, and other equipment. I don't know how far that goes, and I don't know how expensive that is, but I bet it's really hard to do and very expensive to do. Looking at so sort of the, the evolution of cyber threats over time, yeah. um, I'm, I'm curious, given that you've been in this business for a, a while, how have, how have breaches changed over time? Well, <clears throat> a breach, you know, the exfiltration of information. Um, in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, you know, it wasn't so much a breach, it was this, can I get in and tweak a knob, can I flip a switch, Kind of make something happen. Even Steve Jobs, right? He had that tone tone thing for telephones and made long distance calls. So that's a that's a cyber event of sorts. Um, so breaches are really only sort of new. And honestly, we would we wouldn't know a single breach if it weren't for the fact the law says if your PII, if your private information is stolen. You have to be notified, and they have to report it. I to... beg to differ. There are reporters who cover it, whether or not they actually. Oh, okay, get it all right. Publicly. That'd be fine too. <laughs> um, but most breaches uh, that, in, that don't involve PII, we don't hear about. Uh, many of our customers at Red Seal have been breached, uh, even sometimes while we're sitting there watching it happen. Uh, but um, it, it's only because it's made front page news. I mean, the Target attack changed everything for the world. Changed everything. I mean, here's Target. A, fi a Fortune 50 company. They probably had all the, all the products of all the companies I invested in. They probably had gobs of engineers, all the budget they needed, and they got hacked and hacked badly. What, 40 million customer records? They were flooded with detection data. They didn't know what to do. Their, their hair was on fire, and, and they made a bad decision. They decided to not deal with the cyber attack, leave the cash registers up so they could take revenue in instead of stopping the event by shutting down the cash registers, flushing them, and starting over. It's very different than the Tylenol attack, you may remember, when the tainted yeah. uh, drugs. Very different management response. But the point about that attack to me was, and what motivated me greatly was, the bad stuff is inside. It got in somebody, it came in through a third party supply chain, yep. you know, HVAC. And it's in, and it's going to do some damage. It's going to hunt around till it finds its prey. It's going to ship it out. And uh, that's a classic example of robot breach, right? I mean, stuff, it was all totally automated. It's shipping that data out. I don't know how long does it take to ship out 40 million records. Probably hours, maybe days. And they didn't see that coming. So 
that's, that's one for, but the other, the other sort of tampering with, so about 10 years ago in Germany, a steel mill uh, was tampered with espionage. And there were three mills, and the, the competitor said, shut down mill one or we're gonna tamper with you. They said no, and so they tampered with them and caused the mill to close. Affected the profit margin. Second mill said, we're gonna do it again if you don't you know, buy by us. You know, I forget what the reason, maybe it was you know, price fixing or something. But anyway, uh, they shut down the second mill. And the third time they went in there and mucked around with it, they messed up and they overheated the furnace and it killed some people. Now you could do that on a regular basis, couldn't you? So uh, that's not a breach, that's a cyber event. So I, don't, I think breaches have changed only in the sense that once we're in, that command and control can call back out and then you can take over something. And that's, that's, that's not a breach in the data sense that we talk about in the newspaper, but it's a breach of security and trust and certainly the customer is affected by it. So. Yeah. Interesting. Um, this, this will sound a, a little bit self-interested because I spend my days uh, oftentimes helping <laughs> yeah. companies respond to breaches, but I'm curious sort of having- Do you have a backlog? Yeah. <laughs> a backlog, but there, there are a number of them. Um, but I, I'm wondering how you've seen company responses evolve over time. You talked about Target. If you can go kind of like a little bit prior to that and maybe a little bit closer to the present and talk a little bit about how the company responses have evolved. Mm, okay. Prior to that, um, I didn't hear about many. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, and how did they respond internally? Oh, they would. Um, uh, you would detect it. You would uh, shut things down. I've I've talked to people who actually didn't know where it was happening in the data center, and they go inside and just hit the knife switch and cut the power on a whole bank of servers. You might do that. Interesting idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, another case, uh, a, a big, a big data company had uh, data centers in Jersey, uh, St. Louis, and San Francisco, and they detected problems here, and they went in and reprogrammed their routers on the fly to block it from going from New Jersey to St. Louis to San Francisco. So they saved themselves with a little bit of detection, and they had time. That's also a, an element here. Uh, subsequent to that, so J.P. Morgan's attack was a simple Windows server, a Windows NT server that had not been patched. And they found it pretty quickly. J.P. Morgan's got very sophisticated detection systems. They isolated it and did away with it pretty fast. And, you know, then there's Sony. Uh, the bad stuff came in there. Not sure how it got in, actually. But what was, uh, we were involved uh, post the Sony attack in helping them sort it out. But the malware wasn't in the computers. It was in the routers. So you could have all the detection software you want on your computers, which is typically where you put it, and you won't see it. And it was like, I don't know, Thanksgiving, whatever, 2015, when the, the red skull and bones came up, crossbones came up. Nobody knew, they were, nobody knew it was there. That's only supposed to happen in the movies. It, well, it happened in, in their movie. I know. <laughs> Nightmare movie. <laughs> um, but uh, it was in the routers, right? Uh, we had another case. Uh, we had a customer actually uh, called us up and was very angry with me. You know, we've got your software, we understand our network, we're all hooked up, we understand, but yet we were attacked. We said, time out. So we went out there, uh, sent our best engineers on site, and, and we looked, yep, this is true. And what they had done, they had hooked their IP, they had hooked their, their uh, uninterruptible power supplies that run their server farm. They had an IP connection into their main core network. And the malware found that back channel, and there are no detection systems on UPS on systems. So it crawled through and did its damage. We identified the pathway. They didn't think that it was possible, but it was. So, you know, you, that, that's, a, that's a, a real world. Another case, uh, this wasn't a cyber attack, but it was an aha moment. A bank in New York, one of our customers, um, we ran our software and our software finds every route, every path, every protocol in the network. We build this model and we found a whole server farm that was lit up. And they said, what's that? We said, we don't know. And we went to this router and found a, and it was a data center that had been walled off in a remodel. The lights were on, the power was on, the computers were hot, but nobody knew it was there. And it had been there for a while. What was it doing? It was doing whatever that was designed to do. <laughs> uh, but they, had, you know, one of the issues with this whole cyber problem we have is that the tribal knowledge, the guy that designed that system, he probably wasn't there anymore. I mean, they had to literally pull the wire to find it into the wall. Um, and you laugh, but it's true, because the tribal knowledge is just moving on, right? In, the, in a corporation, a CISO's average lifetime is 14 months. 
Uh, I bet he barely finds a bathroom in 14 months. But, um, and why yeah. is that? Well, because something bad happens when they get fired. Uh, you really think that that's the driver to the, the short? No, they, they get frustrated. They, get, they don't get the budget they need. They, they have their standards. They just can't quite get done what they got to get done, and they, and they get a better offer maybe somewhere <laughs> else. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's that tribal knowledge that's hard to capture uh, that our software does, and many other softwares do too, but that, that's where you start to solve our cybersecurity problem with resilience is you've got to know what you have. A case in point, this building, this room, I can't see it because of the lights, but this room's got a sprinkler system. It's got heat detectors. It's probably got gas detectors. This room was built to be resilient. We're all sitting here. Did we check the compliance certificate when we walked in the door? No. Anybody come up the elevator? Did you check the compliance certificate of the elevator? No. Why? Because we trust it. We have a government that enforces these things. And it's built by people, it's inspected by people, and it's tested by people. And it gets a check mark. And we trust it to be the case. There's nothing like that in the cyber world. That, that concept is foreign. We ha that's why we're losing. We have to change that mentality and make it happen. So are companies any better now at responding? Yeah. Um, either uh, maybe both from a technological standpoint um, in terms of maybe speed or what have you, but then also in sort of managing the, the business more external side. Yeah, part of being resilient is being able to respond to the threat. So yeah, our detection systems are excellent. In fact, most of the IPOs lately have been companies that provide detection technology for Scout, CrowdStrike, these guys. So their, their revenues are going through the roof and it's because they're watching what's going on inside. They are more resilient. In our surveys, and we do them every year, only about a third of our companies that we serve, that we survey about 200, Fortune 1000, about a third of them report that they actually have a response system, a response team. That'd be like the fire department. Can you imagine living in a town without a fire department? Uh, these cor most corporations don't have it. So it's like Target. The alarm bells go off, uh, the consoles are lit up, they start typing, trying to figure out what's going on. No, they, they don't know where to start. Um, that's typically the case, but it's getting better. It's getting better. Three years ago, I was in uh, London at a panel talking to corporations, and I was absolutely amazed. The economists actually had, in that time, uh, response teams. And they had trained them. They do tabletop examples. They do real things where someone will go in and maybe shut down a computer or create an abnormality that gets detected, and then they have to figure out where it is. No, not many people do that. But testing and drilling is really important. So you were talking earlier about the, the challenge of cybersecurity being seen as a cost center. And obviously, here in Silicon Valley, startups have a lot to worry about, and cybersecurity is not always at the top of the list. Um, what, what can startups and smaller companies do to at least improve their chances of not having to, to deal with some sort of major cyber event and, and protect their most valuable asset, which is presumably their data? And, and in a lot of cases, it's going to be their IP. Yeah. Yeah, it's very hard for small companies, any company, modest company, and billion dollar companies to even have enough technology or staff to deal with it because it's so complex and there's this cost issue. So there have been another, a number of companies have been formed. Cloudflare was one of the last ones I did at Venrock in San Francisco. They focused on the long tail. So they studied the, the cyber technologies of the best and then they deployed that and they offered up on the cheap for small companies. Even Red Seal uses Cloudflare. So we host our site there and it checks all our mail and does all this stuff. So that's a sort of a service. The other thing you can do, you can actually hire, there's now plenty of teams that'll come in and do penetration testing, they call it. They'll, in the old days, it used to be dumpster diving, right? Check your garbage and see if you threw something sensitive away. Now it's all zeros and ones. But there are people do that now regularly. And uh, we actually do that at Red Seal. We hire people to see if they can break in. And it's a uh, you know, we, we do... Do they ever succeed? Yeah, of course they do. And we're not perfect. My, my digital resilience score, uh, which is one of the measures we use, is about 800. But, you know, 850 is perfect, but nobody's perfect. Um, talk a little bit about that score. Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, one of the things I learned in uh, management and business school is that you cannot manage what you do not measure. And you have to measure things. And in all my years at Venrock, no one ever brought a cyber deal to me that would say, I'm going to use this software, evaluate your infrastructure, and give you a score. And furthermore, tell you how to fix it and make it better. So uh, a couple of years into Red Seal, we had shifted the company toward this resilience concept. And we said, we need a score. 
And that's sort of the second step of reserve. The first step is understanding what you have. Well, how's the building built? How's, this, how's the network look? What are the connections? What are the ins and outs? All that stuff. And then you have measurements against that equipment. Is it, is it up to date? Is it all connected properly? Do you have some dangling links to the outside world that you don't know? Has someone, has someone hooked into AWS under their, under their desk and got a back door in? It's you usually know? the CEO who does that. That is, yes, it is true. <laughs> it is true. Um, those things, uh, we sort all of that, but then you have to measure it. And that measurement is really important because management doesn't need all that gobbledygook technical stuff. In fact, cyber should be, the technology part of it is leave it to the technologists. Management needs to measure stuff. And our score measures it. And we picked FICO score, a nice personal credit score. You're welcome, FICO. Um, and, FICO uh, actually has their own cybersecurity. Yeah, yeah, we've talked. <laughs> <laughs> Theirs is, in never mind. Uh, anyway, it's ours- not nearly as good. Not I'm as sure. nearly as good. Ours is inside out. But the point is, if I measure my network today and it's 625, and I run the software tomorrow, and it comes back and it's 625, 625, and then it goes to 600, 575, five. something's changing. Something's, I should be, as a manager, as the COO, or I should say, call down and say, what's going on? Who forgot to do something or who changed what? Sometimes you take systems out of compliance to do maintenance, and guess what? They forget to put them back. And that's the kind of thing that a measurement will discover. Or let's say you acquire another company. Uh, this is a whole use case for the whole cyber world. Uh, you, we're, we're running, we're cooking along at 800, and we acquire somebody, we test their network, and they're 400, so our score comes back 600. Well, holy cow, stop, time out, disconnect, let's fix, and then before connect. So scoring gives you something to compare. It's a relative thing. It's not an absolute thing. It's not like a credit score that's, you know, if you have a 750, you can buy a car or you get a loan for a car. It's not that. It's a relative thing to alert management that there's a problem. So we... We uh, run that all the time. We test clouds. We test the legacy networks. We test the equipment. It's all bundled in that one number. Because boards, from my experience, I've been on you know, eight public boards and 50 or so private boards. You know, I get all these numbers. All I care about is numbers. Revenue's going up, profit's going up, market share going up, or is it going down? Cyber can be exactly the same way. So I'm very excited by that. And so shocking, since 2016, a lot of companies have their own little score now, including FICO, <laughs> <laughs> on cyber. Yeah. Um, so you, you're, you're, you were referencing um, you know, boards and CEOs, and I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, given that they don't necessarily need to know exactly all the, the yeah. technological details, yeah. Yeah. what do CEOs need to know when it comes to cybersecurity, and what questions should they be asking? Oh, man. Uh, I just gave a, a, a little talk to a public company board uh, just yesterday. The, the question they should ask is, what is my digital resilience score? In addition to that. Okay. Um, but no, seriously, they should be asking how, you know, no, gone is the day where the CISO comes on the board and says, I got it, guy. Oh, no problem, boss. We're good to go. You're safe. Uh-uh. That's not acceptable. They should ask, can you prove to me? Can you do quantitative measurements to show me that the money you spent made it better? or the money you spend is gonna change our business or whatever it is, and give me a result. That's what I think they should ask. Show me, prove to me. Because we get financial audits to prove that our top line and bottom line are what they are. Our technology should have a similar audit. Um, I think it's that important. We've, this digital transformation insists upon that kind of an audit. So that's what I think they should be asking. And they should, you know, you should have in that boardroom, there should be an expert at the table. The SEC is talking about requiring, you know, to be on the audit committee, you have to have a CPA and all that sort of stuff. Boards are, it's SEC's talking about, it. maybe every board should have a cyber expert on it. I guess I could be employed for life in that case, but. Um, You're probably set on that front end. Yeah, I'm probably all right. Uh, but, um, but really, I mean, you need to have people in the room that can understand it at a level to, to get something done. So that's, those are the kinds of questions. So what should the CEO do when their CISO comes and they said, I got it covered, don't worry about it? I'd say, uh, you're fired, and uh, I'll, I'll, hire, I'll hire a smart woman that'll come in and give me some numbers. And now you're contributing to that 14-month turnover, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, what is the biggest cyber cybersecurity mistake that companies are making? Boy, that's a tough one. I think uh, viewing... Or too many to count, is that... No, no, no. It's really, it's, it's, more, it's not a mistake. It's not an action mistake. It's a philosophy mistake. They view it as a cost center. You could, turn, you could turn this whole thing into a positive, right? 
I am cyber secure, here's my digital resilience score. You can use it against your competition. But then you've got to invest in it like you invest in products. In the book, I talk a little bit about you should view cyber as a little bit of a competition if you're not doing it right, right? It's a threat. It's a threat to your business, just like a good competitor is a threat to your business. So I think you could turn it around and not view it as a cost center, view it as an investment opportunity and bring your business up. In fact, you, you may remember uh, in the 80s, uh, there was this whole thing called Japan Inc., and they were going to take over the world with their fantastically high quality cars. And America's car CEOs said, no, 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 quality costs too much money. We can't do that. Well, the Japanese proved us wrong. And I think cyber, unfortunately, is in that it costs too much category right now. We've not stopped to think about it to make it where you're actually going to save money, but actually make a better product. And that is your company so that you enjoy the trust and confidence of your customers and investors. That's what I think. Well, no, and I, I, it's, it's an interesting point because I think that um, a lot of times when companies are trying to decide what to do um, when it comes to security, um, you know, and, and you were referencing kind of the, the end runs that people will do around it. Well, a lot of times people are circumventing security for, totally. for business purposes, right? Yes. Um, I mean, what, what are the kinds of trade-offs that people are making? Um, and and how, do you, how do you get around that? Um, how do you deal with that? Because human nature is going to be, you know, this is in my way, I need to move it. Yeah. Some of that, we just got to get over it, like dual factor authentication for logging on us. We just got to get over it. Just get over it, accept it. We lock our cars, we lock our doors, we have keys in our pocket, get over it. But there are things, I believe, uh, uh, here's an example. I was uh, giving a talk about resilience to an insurance company in Chicago, and uh, I asked them, this is a bunch of underwriters, people who didn't know cybersecurity from anything. I asked them if they knew what phishing was, and they all, yeah, we know what phishing is. I said, well, do you take a phishing test? Does the company send out a random test and see if you click on it and cause trouble? Yeah, they did, and they go to phishing training and all this stuff. We have a little 90-minute web thing that we use at Red Seal that everybody trains on to see if you understand how to detect a fish. And, um, and then, so I said, so how many people have failed the test? And about a third of the people raised their hand. And I said, how many people have failed it twice? And about half the hands went down, so now we're down to a sixth. And I said, how many people failed it three times? All the hands went down. And I said, well, why is that? And they said, because if you fail it three times, the company has a policy, you're fired. Fired. <laughs> So uh, that's the, so you have to have these policies around this. So if I have a policy that says if I hook up an AWS over some modem I have, or no, well, that's an old term, but through another, through another port and I bypass the firewall, uh, I should pay a penalty for that. And people need to understand what the rules are. You know, we sign all this confidentiality and how we'll treat money and intellectual property, we need to understand what the cyber rules are too. And I, it, again, it's about compliance. You have a policy, you have compliance, and you enforce it. And I, you know, I think we'll get over it pretty soon. You'll, you'll never stop that one guy that's going to plug it in and cheat. That's just, you're, 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 and you're just going to have to fire, fire him. him. Yeah, or you know, really call him down on it. You know? um, I mean, you're, you're making a good point, though, that oftentimes employees are going to be a company's weakest link when it comes to cybersecurity. Oh, humans are, yeah. Um, what do you do about that? I mean, short of firing people. So let's 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 yeah. let's posit that we're not just going to fire people. We're going to have an additional sort of process. Well, you train what you, them. What do you do? Well, you can train them uh, to on, be able, on what though. Well, there's you can test them on phishing. That's the yeah. number one. Yeah. Ninety-five percent of all breaches start with a phish attack. Right. So that's the one you got to focus on, right? So we get that done, and they'll say you fail that. Well, maybe you need to be in a part of the company where you're not talking on the web or not dealing, if you're, if you're taking customer request emails, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Maybe you should be working on some other part of the company where phishing isn't a threat to you per se. That's hard to do, but it can be done. So we could treat people a little better. I think a more interesting question is, what if the CEO fails it three times, <laughs> right? What does the board do about that? Who those scores? Yeah, right. I mean, what does the board do about that? You take his computer away from him or her or whoever it is, just take it away? You can't do that. So, you know, it starts at the top. The leadership has to abide by the rules and the policies, and you have to communicate that down. I, really, you can retrain people. You can, you know, look, uh, if I train to be a welder and I turn out to be a really crappy welder, they might put me in, you know, plumbing, and I'm a great plumber. So, I mean, cyber's kind of got similar, not cyber, but there are digital jobs that can be moved to different ways so that you remove that threat or that risk to the corporation. 
It's harder. Maybe. I, I guess okay. one thing that, 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 that strikes me is, and, and this happened just because we were working with um, two companies in fairly quick succession, um, where the source of the breach was a, an extraordinarily guessable password. And so we were working with one company, and it turned out that it was um, you know, spring 2017 was the password that you know, somehow everybody guessed, because everybody's required like every three months or so right, to change their password. Right. Right. Um, so then we're going and, and we're talking to the next company, <laughs> and they're talking about how you know, they're dealing with this issue. <laughs> I said, let me guess, it was a password issue. It was summer 2017. They said, how did you know? <laughs> how do you guard against that? I mean, that's not a technological, I mean, no, that's like no, simply no. your employees log on to your system. That's not a, a technological sort of vocation that they have with the company. <laughs> it's true. Well, you, you have to change your password, and you can force that through their Active Directory and other means. Uh, there's lots of single sign-on technologies. Okta's a really good one we use, and it gives you access to all the corporate digital assets when you go through there. And sometimes I come on and it says, you must change your password, and, and I'll... So I'll just change a digit or something. So, oh, no, no, you did that last time. And it'll say, you got to pick something totally new. And so I've taken to doing really new things. So I actually keep a, a password manager, mm -hmm. uh, which helps me with the 260 passwords that I have, um, uh, kind of a thing. So that, but, but there's technology to force you to change your password. That, you know. But um, how do you get a company to even adopt it, right? I mean, if that, it's, it's obviously a pervasive problem. It well, seems like cheap. there's a pretty straightforward yeah. solution, and yet there people don't. Yeah, yeah, it's not being adopted. I don't know how you get people to do it. Maybe you can. Uh, I don't know. That's a, maybe that's a compliance thing that uh, the government has to pass some sort of policy or something. But I don't know how you get people to do that. I think you just have to be aware. Um, you know, uh, that's a that's a tough one. I don't have a good answer for that one. Call me up. I'll tell you. How. I will. Uh, so so um, kind of coming back around to the resilience side of things. Um, how many companies are digitally resilient today? I don't know. Uh, Rough guess. A few. Handful. Uh, low double digit percent, I think. And what I mean by that is they could withstand a, a, a sustained attack of some kind. They would be able to sustain it, deal with it, and continue their business. Right? It's like uh, the building's on fire, the fire department shows up, and everybody keeps going on. Um, very few do that. Uh, every technology isn't perfect because it's built by people, it's operated by people, and it's maintained by people. So it's not perfect. It's so, like a really constant theme that people are the problem. Yeah, it's so the we people. get rid of the people and we'll, we'll be got <laughs> Robots. Did you see that article today? Yeah. yeah. Jobs for the robot economy in Axios. Um, the, uh, so it, it, there are imperfections, and all it takes is one little, so remember, we have to be perfect 100% of the time, and the bad guy only has to be lucky once, and he's in and does something to you. So I think uh, you just have to be prepared. I th the, the hard part about resilience is time, and, and the, the, if you have the technology, you have the capabilities, and you get the detection, you get the alarms, and sometimes it can take weeks to figure out where the incident is. And if you're a global corporation with things all over, uh, you know, you better have named your routers, geolocation kinds of things, so you start, you know, where to start looking. Um, it's, it becomes a, a, a hunting game. And then you get there, and then you gotta decide, what do I do about it? Well, if it's a critical piece of infrastructure, you may not wanna turn it off. That's what, that's what Target did, right? bad idea. Sony blanked out their entire network. They just took all the routers and, and, and factory reset them. They lost their network. We helped them rebuild it eight days. It took us to rebuild it. So they, they made a very senior decision to blank out Sony Pictures. I mean, think about that. What a huge business decision. Huge business decision. Cost them hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm sure. So um, it's that time factor uh, you know, it's funny, I, you, you probably know this better than I in the business you're in, but if you have an attack and you call the FBI, the first thing they tell you is don't touch anything. Let it run. Let it run. We want to get the forensics in there. Um, but time is our enemy in this case, and you have to decide what your strategy is, whether you want to unplug it, turn it off, sandbox it, honeypot it, whatever, all these technical terms. But that fire department better show up, that incident response team better show up, and like I say, a third 
the companies we survey have incident response teams, so maybe, maybe they're more resilient than I think, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think many are. Can you, get, can you give an example or two of what you would consider to be a digitally resilient company? Sure. Um, Red Seal is perfectly digitally resilient, of course. Okay. Uh, How about uh, two examples? <laughs> two examples. Okay, no. Um, no but seriously, we, uh, you know, you've, you've, uh, you've trained your people. You run frequent tests, penetration tests on your business, and, and, and quiz your people electronically and digitally. You have all the proper detection systems. For all the prevention and detection is that you got to have, that's JAX or better. And then you will have this ability to respond. So you will have a team uh, who will be capable of doing that. Um, I really shouldn't give many. Uh, there's one company. There, many of our three-letter agencies are very good at this. And I know that for a fact. Uh, not many corporations are good at this, mostly because they're gigantic, right? And they just have not made the investment. Um, I'm just trying to think. Banks are very good at it. J.P. Morgan's very good at it. Uh, their architecture gives them resilience. They have a, a ringed architecture for their network, New York Stock Exchange. I took a tour there a few years ago. They get a half a trillion attacks a day. Half a trillion. And only about 30 or 40 are of any consequence, and they have teams that are on it instantly. And the New York Stock Exchange trading floor is actually not connected to the internet because they don't believe in perfection. So that, that's... I thought you were going to say they don't believe in the internet. Well, they, <laughs> no, they believe in the internet. Uh, but they have this, this, you know, it's called an air gap. And that's how they've become resilient. And, but they have these teams that get in there and, and jam it. So, yeah, the New York Stock Exchange is very resilient. Thank yeah. goodness. So you, you, mentioned, you mentioned that many of the three-letter agencies um, are, are resilient, um, which is interesting. And um, I mean, I spent a fair amount of time covering yeah. those agencies. Yes. One issue that those agencies have not controlled for quite as well, somewhat surprisingly, is actually the insider threat. Right. How do you build resiliency around that? Yeah, that, that's a good question. That's a human psychology thing. It's people again. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, it's a Snowden thing, right? Uh, but there have been, been others, right? Yeah, there have been. I mean, but, you know, he was a contractor, right? It's like, why would you have a con? Anyway, um, maybe there's process, maybe there's non-cyber processes that help you with that insider threat to make it better. I'm not really, I, that, that's about all. I, I, I'm just trying to think what I would do. But I think it's a psychology, it's profile, it's background checks, it's all that stuff. So if, if I have a company that I want to make sure that I'm going to be resilient and bounce back in the face of, of some sort of major incident, how much does that cost? Oh boy, that's a new question. You didn't give me that one beforehand. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, well, it depends. I mean, if it's a, a how bill, would I calculate it? How would I? Get, about a thousand, I, oh I well, a thousand people. You probably have two hundred routers. Uh, each person has three or four devices, so that's maybe five thousand. So um, you could. You can make it resilient with, uh, oh, probably less than $10 million. That's not bad. No, that's capital. Is that worth it? Oh, my goodness, yes. Absolutely <laughs> worth it. If question. I want to stay in business, was that a trick question? That was an easy question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Um, short of going off the grid, what can an individual do yeah. to make sure that they're, I mean, you were talking at the outset, sort of, you know, identity theft. I mean, there are a lot of things that, you know, consumers now obviously have to worry about if you have a phone and a computer and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, what, what can individuals do? You know, I get this question a lot. I think the first thing an individual needs to decide is what's important to them. Um, uh, you cannot imagine how they're going to take your personal information and use it. So you got to decide, is my phone number important? Your phone number is more unique than your social security number. Uh, so I don't ever post my phone number. My social security number I know is out there, but my phone number is pretty hard to find, I think, in most cases. Although someone just found it, right? Okay. <laughs> you can Google me up. Um, but um, you need to decide what's important. For example, uh, if, 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 you have, if you do banking online, you should do it from a secure network. Maybe your home behind your router with a firewall and everything. You shouldn't do it at Starbucks on an open Wi-Fi system where people can watch your traffic. I was talking with a cybersecurity expert once who said that he won't even do it at home. He'll only do banking at work. Okay. So he trusts his work network Apparently more than he, he trusts his own. <laughs> 
But you got to decide what's important, and then you have to take the appropriate precautions. Certainly, dual factor authentication for anything that's important, any transactional things you do is very important. Um, uh, and, you know, changing your password, those are sort of hygiene things. Keep your equipment updated if you can. I keep pointing at my phone here. Um, keep your equipment updated because typically that's the best preventative thing you can do, that and your password changing. But, but mostly decide what's important. Decide what you're going to put on a server at your home or, you know, where you put your pictures. Everybody uses all these public systems, you know, and, you know, you can... You can get in and go backwards into phones and get videos and pictures of all kinds of things. You, just, you don't have to go to, you can go to Facebook too, I guess. But you have to decide, you know. Uh, I've definitely stepped back from Facebook big time, uh, as a lot of people that I didn't really care to be reunited with tried to reunite with me. <laughs> so um, yeah, my wife appreciates that. Uh, uh, but, you know, there's just things like that. You have to decide what's important to you. And maybe being out there is very important to you. So you're out there. Uh, but I'm not. That's what I would do. Uh, and then take the appropriate actions. So as someone who has followed the cybersecurity industry for yeah. quite a number of years, um, where is it headed <laughs> at this point? Well. Besides failing. No, <laughs> Now, it is uh, certainly headed to AI, uh, and AI in the sense of uh, uh, my CTO, Dr. Mike, likes to call it uh, machine reasoning, because it's not just about data recognition, because a really good threat won't repeat itself, right? So all that data uh, analysis is only good for maybe a moment in time. So you have to sort of reason. You have to sort of look at what it's done and other things. You've got to put logic together to decide where it's headed. So I, that definitely is a big area, and there's a lot of companies that are growing very fast around here that, that sell you threat streams. So they'll uh, attack IQ in, in Southern California. They'll actually send an attack stream at your network, and they'll tell you where it, where it lands and how it found its way through and all that. And that's an interesting way to, that's a penetration testing to the nth degree, to a very high degree. Um, but th so threat, pen very sophisticated penetration testing is where it's headed. Diagnosis? Di yeah, uh, forensics, right? Uh, diagnosis, I mean, just getting an inventory of what you have and how it's all hooked up, that's what we do uh, as a first level. But um, I think ultimately it becomes a very automated orchestration. So you'll have the monitors and the detection systems. You'll have the firewalls that you can control the rules so you can shut the doors if you have to. If you detect a problem in a data center, you literally, uh, an automatic system can make some analysis of where it's going. Today, we, at Red Seal, we diagnose a problem and we give you the recipe. And people say, well, why don't you just give them a big red button and change it? Ah, you know, these things aren't perfect. And changing somebody's system willy-nilly may not be the bright thing to do. Um, so we stop there and say, it's to you, the human, to decide how to fix it. I think that will all go away in time as artificial intelligence diagnoses these problems, and they sort of are seen over and over and over and over. And finally, I'd say we have to share more data. And that's hard, because when you share, you're exposing a liability. And if I share too much, then maybe people won't buy my product. But I need to know what's going on in my neighborhood. I got, I, I got to know, right? If there's, a, if there's a, sadly, a house burglary in my neighborhood, I like to know about it. Um, likewise, if I'm a business and my, my business in the same sort of net gets attacked, I kind of want to know about it. So that sharing becomes it. So that's where it's going. AI, automation, orchestration, and uh, uh, sharing. Okay, so you sparked one more question for me, then I'm going to go to the questions from the audience. Okay. Um, so you're saying that cybersecurity is going to AI, but the hackers are going to AI too. Yes. So what does that look like? Oh, it's a you know arms race, right? Who's the smarter? I mean, they say there's about 100,000 bad guys out there, but they probably have millions of computers, right? So uh, I don't know. It's, it's an arms race. We're going to have to get really smart. We're going to have to become resilient. We're gonna, we cannot prepare for every threat and attack. There's, we can't whack a mole forever. So we have to be prepared to shut things down or take evasive action and closure. That's just what we have to do. We did it with buildings, cars, airplanes. We got to do it with cyber. Sounds easy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and, and cheap. Yeah, and super. Well, you said it was $10 million? Ten, uh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> it's more than I have been. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK, so is there much effort to organize and employ the breachers 
hackers to turn their skills toward doing good, so moving the black hats to white hats? Yes. Uh, I actually had a company once called Whole Security down in Austin, Texas, where we went out and found what we call gray hats. They didn't like being called black hats. But we found gray hats. Who likes being called gray? Because it's sort of between white and black. They won't definitely work for the white hat guys, but they will help the white, house, white hat guys make their products better, which is what we did. So there are, there are groups out there organized to do that. I'm not, and you know, those are the days did when they, they were, work. It did for that company. Semantic acquired it, and the technology is now embedded in most of the end user products. Uh, because, um, anyway, you, you, you want to know what you're having, and, and I think this was, these were early days, and they were probably hungry more than they are now, the bad guys, I mean. So maybe we just found a time when they needed some money, um, and they helped us. But I think there are organizations that do that. Interesting. Um, how do you flush your financial data? or your medical system, or your heart pacer? Oh, your pacemaker? I guess so, yeah. Wow, how do you flush it? That's what it says. <laughs> well, Sony did that Doctor. with their routers. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sony did that with their routers. They re factory reset them, and you can do that. Uh, it's hard. These days, data is everywhere, so if you've been, you know, I, you'd have to go to your bank, and you'd have to talk to them about flushing the caches and everything. Uh, I know PCs, uh, I actually have a piece of software on my uh, Mac that flushes all the caches. It just wipes them out, saves disk space and other things. But it cleans out things, and there's probably technologists in this room that know more about that than me. Um, but there's software that will help you do that. And you can only do it to the stuff you own. But your bank, your doctor, your hospital, Social Security Administration, Veterans Administration, I don't know how you flush that. I don't think that's possible. Well, but that's, it's interesting that you raised that because um, under GDPR, aren't there some requirements that actually companies would have to be able to at least in part do? They, they have to like claim that? that they can do that, and if you ask them to do it, they're supposed to be able to flush it. Yeah, that's coming. Yeah. <laughs> GDPR, this is a European standard for uh, data privacy. Um, isn't single sign-on a non-resilient technology as it creates a single point of failure with a major impact? Well, it could if it's pretty bad single sign-on. Uh, like I say, the one we use, Okta, is really good. It forces us to change our passwords. Uh, we have to use the API, so you can't just hook anything into it. I can't just randomly put something into Okta and mess around with it. It's pretty secure stuff. It's, it's, it's been penetration tested by us. We, we, did, we went through our own little cyber test of it. I suppose any single port is a, a risk, right? It's like that key for my car. If I lose the key, then you know it's a single failure. But uh, it's pretty good these days. So I trust it more than I trust being able to log into 20 different apps. You're actually laptop. raising an interesting point. How do you assess the cybersecurity of the vendors that you use? Well, I wish I had more on that. Uh, some of them are really good, and they let us do it. And some of them is hands off. And I probably should, the hands off, I won't tell you who that is. They're big companies, and we all use their stuff all the time. Uh, but the, the, you know, most people, it's, it's just part of business now, particularly the cloud vendors. You can, uh, you can get reports, you can send your own people in, uh, AWS, Azure, they all allow you to do an assessment uh, against that technology so that you know it's, it's good or it's good enough for you. And you can get repeated reports. And that's just, you know, that's like anything. Uh, it, I'm buying bits, I'm buying zeros and ones. If I'm manufacturing something, I may be buying aluminum or steel or wood. I'm going to test that wood and steel and so forth. So I'm going to test the zeros and ones, too. That, that's a new process that's taking hold. And, and it sounds like, from what you're saying, that you trust the security of the cloud, at least in certain contexts? Oh, yeah. I actually think the cloud may be safer than a lot of legacy systems. Because the legacy systems, the guys and gals that built them, they've long moved on. It's all tribal knowledge. It's wasted and gone. But the cloud's brand new, and it's been built with a lot of these threats in mind. So they've actually done a lot of good to help you there. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than going into a, a building that's 20 years old and it's wired and you have no clue what it looks like. Will organizations ever be able to effectively defend against new major zero day, a new major zero-day threat proactively, or will cybersecurity always be a cat and mouse game? So that's, I guess, similar to whack-a-mole. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit whack-a-mole. Uh, no, there's no perfect defense against it. Um, I think the key there is rapid detection and then a response. Because uh, 
there will be a threat that we will not understand and it will take us down. We used to think, you know, interesting, a, a threat that, that people don't worry about, we usually think of a threat as like a fire. You light something and it catches on fire and it goes fast. You know, what if it's a slow threat? What if it's like I just take your first name, next week I take your last name, and then next week I go out on the web and find your social, you know, that's a slow zero day threat. It's perfectly legitimate, hard to detect, almost impossible to detect. And it's only until I assemble it and do something with it, that's when I'll catch it. But there's really no way. It's a whack-a-mole game. Is the cybersecurity industry getting any better at finding zero days before they pop? I think they are getting better. Yeah, I think they're getting better. Yeah. In what way? Oh, uh, I knew you'd ask that. Um, uh, you, know, threat, you know, look, um, bombs have signatures. Threats have signatures. And it's the same bad guys doing the same bad thing, whether it's uh, somebody in Kansas or somebody in Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, so we've really learned a lot. And a lot of these threat companies study this stuff all the time. So they, they look for classes of threats. And if they see that class, they just assume it's a threat, and they'll sandbox it or just shut it down or whatever. So we're getting a lot better at it because we're studying the threats. We're studying the bomb maker's signatures in these things. How can consumers identify companies or vendors that have digital resilience when making decisions where to shop online? Boy, Whew. they can't yet. Um, you know, in the early days of commerce, when you put your credit card in, there used to be this little green thing down there that said it's been certified and all kinds of stuff. That is very hard to do, and usually because there's about eight or nine systems between you and the actual merchant who's going to ship that to you. And all those systems have to be good and protected. I don't, I, I, that's, that's hard, and I don't think that's going to get solved quickly. Um, we're, you, know, um, you know, in a browser, you can look for the HTTPS, the security thing. Those are OK, um, but it's not, it's, it's not perfect. So it's not, there's no way. There's no way to tell. Should there be a way? I think Some so. Some good housekeeping. Yeah, absolutely. This is United, the UL for software. Yeah, or, yeah absolutely. There should be. Should be able to put it up, but why isn't why doesn't that exist? Is it just right. a because we all buy stuff without worrying about it? So there's no demand from consumers. You know, if suddenly you're selling stuff without a UL software, I'll just use that as an example, and a competitor stands up and says we're safe and secure, and all of a sudden traffic goes down here and, and buying goes up here, that'll be noticed. That would cause people to say, ah, maybe we need to do that. That's what I mean about let, making cybersecurity an advantage investing in it, selling it as a trust factor to your customers. I don't know anybody that does that. Do they not do that because it's a huge risk in the event that you get hacked? Yeah. Because that's your differentiator that just got whacked. Absolutely. And that's my biggest fear as a CEO of a cyber company is that my product gets hacked. How, what do you do to guard against that besides oh, we, obviously use rights? Oh my gosh. We, we pound the heck out of it. We put it out there, let attackers hit it. We talk to our customers all the time. We get notices of, well, we think this might, and boy, we're on it. Uh, everybody does that. Every, all the firewall guys, uh, Checkpoint, on whose board I serve, uh, they have a whole lab. They'll, they, when someone calls up Checkpoint and says, we think you have a flaw here, they thank them for it, they test it, they prove it, and then they fix it, and then they reveal to the world we fixed it. There's kind of this, I don't know, gentleman's agreement, I guess you could say, between the hackers and the products. And uh, we all participate in that. That's interesting, because responsible disclosure is obviously a theme that exists in different industries. And yet, um, we've certainly seen cases where that, you know, that didn't necessarily play out that yeah. way. Um, I feel like Black Hat routinely has things like that, right? <laughs> um, so uh, you know, how, uh, how important is it to have responsible disclosure? responsible disclosure within um, any particular industry? And I mean, is that something that you can enforce or you just kind of hope for the best? Oh, no, I think you can enforce it. I mean, if you think about all the serial numbers on airplane parts, that's responsible disclosure. If something's fraudulent or it's changed or it looks funny, people check it. Uh, I think that's uh, pretty much jacks are better in the business of if, you're, if you've got critical systems or you know, life-threatening risk involved, those things are checked pretty well these days. But I think in the software side, we're probably not completely there yet. 
Um, I don't know, I don't know if my phone has that capability. You know, if, if someone finds a flaw on an iPhone, they notify Apple, I, I guess it would get fixed quickly. I'm, I'm not sure. But I do know at Checkpoint we check it and we pay people for it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's. do you think that more companies should be adopting bug bounties? I feel like there was a there yeah. was sort of a surge in that, but yeah. I haven't heard about it as much recently. Well, it was about. news when it was cool, and now right. it's not maybe cool. everybody does, it's not cool. But does everybody do it? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. What, what, what is the Why value you, in doing it? Well, you get people to bang on your thing, your software, your product, and find the problems and the flaws with it. Like I say, it's been built by humans. It's got flaws. You just can't test for all of them at any given time. I mean, you know, when you've got millions of lines of software running on a particular product, you cannot run, you cannot run on enough regression testing against it to prove its capability. You put it out in the wild, in the field, and suddenly something happens. That's news, and you need to work on that and fix it quickly. Companies do pay for that. To put it out, they put it out there and said, all the black hats, hit it. See if you can figure it out. That's what we did at Whole Security. So, I mean, we hired people to do that. We paid the money for that. Um, I want to I want to go back to a, an issue that you raised earlier, just because it's it's one that I've been interested in for a long time. Um, managing cyber risk around acquisitions and mergers and things like that. Good. Um, what what should smart companies be doing to to manage that kind of cyber risk if you're looking to make an acquisition? Yeah, M and A is a big use case for a lot of cyber, and so I've done a lot of M and A. Been been I've been M'd and I've been A'd, um, uh, and uh, you know, you, when, you, when, you're, when you're in a deal like that, you know, lawyers, accountants, uh, private investigators, they all come in and they present, they, they do through these volumes and volumes of paper. They check your resumes, they do background checks, they do financials, you know, for every year. They, they, they stress test maybe your financial electronic systems to make sure that it's working and all that. So there's all this, but no one ever checks that cyber. Now, it wasn't such a big deal 10 years ago when we weren't in the middle of this digital transition, but now everything's digital. So it would make perfect sense to me, and I've written and published a number of places on this, where you should go in and test someone's cyber. You should see what their policies are. You should see if they're in effect. You should train the, see what training the people have had. You should do all of that. You should use Red Seal software to understand what the score is. How good is the network? Um, it, I think it should be a requirement, and any smart company will do that before they actually acquire. And by the way, Yahoo, right? What did, what did that little breach cost them? A half a billion dollars? Uh, $350 million, yeah. Oh, okay, something like that. Rounding so, error. Yeah, right. Yeah. So what would it have cost them to do a little cyber uh, investigation? Not $350 million. And maybe it would have saved them, saved the shareholders $350 million. So that's a real-world example of that was extremely costly. But I think you should always check. You're going to check everything. You're the, look, if Red Seal gets acquired, they're going to check my resume and everything. They ought to check my cyber, too. But one of the issues that companies run into in that situation is that there's just a limit, that, that the, the, the company that's going to be acquired won't allow it. They won't allow sort of that level of delving into their technology. There's a thing called escrow. So you, you make warranties. You tell me you're good. You tell me I've got this, and I've got the routers are all upgraded, and I've got all these firewalls in place. And I buy you, and I've set aside a hunk of escrow, maybe 20%, 25%, and I found out that your warranties were not as good as you thought. Warranties, by the way, apply to taxes and liabilities that are often on the balance sheet. So I go in there, and I find this, and I bring it out, and I say, well, you know, you're, you're two revs behind on this set of routers, and that'll cost $10,000. It's like getting your house, right? When you, when you sell a house, you go through these inspections. Exactly the same thing. It can be handled post-transaction with a larger escrow. Or you can just cancel the transaction if it's that severe. So why isn't it being done? I don't know. Um, well, actually, a lot of the, we have many law firms that use our software, and they actually have now recommended that it be used by their clients for M&A. So I think it's starting to catch on. You read uh, I, every day or every other day, I get this general counsel newsletter, and there's always, always on the front page, there's a cyber story of where it mattered in an M&A event of some kind. You're, you're raising an interesting point. Um, in, in terms of within a company, um, who should be focused on cybersecurity issues within the company? The general counsel. In what way? What is how? What, well, what, what should their role be? When well, 
the general counsel's job is to make sure the company obeys all the laws and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's also to protect the company from making bad decisions or bad choices and bad acquisitions, for example. Um, uh, and a really interesting story, one of my companies called Vontu, which was a leader in data leak back in the day, uh, data leak, no one believed it was a problem. No one thought it was a problem. And so Joseph Ancinelli, the CEO, said, I'll just, let me just drop this computer here. We'll just take your, your uh, feed and we'll just, we'll just watch the traffic going by. And we'll just do it for 24 hours and then we'll come and look at the data. In this particular case, this was a financial services company and the uh, owner and CEO's name is on the door and his personal information went out in that 24 hour period. It was a $4 million sale like that. Who paid for it? The general counsel. General counsel generally has, I think, infinite budget. CISO doesn't have an infinite budget. General counsel does. So it's a, but, and that person, I mean, think about it. That's the person that ultimately, in a breach, the, the CEO calls up the GC, right? You get the GC, you know this. They quarterback it. Yeah, they quarterback Oftentimes. the whole thing. They're in charge. And they can spend the money on the spot, or they can make the risk decision. That's a risk we're going to take. That's their job. And so I think they're actually the, one of the best, look, they understand risk better than anybody. And they're not like the CEO who's probably an, an, an optimist. <laughs> he wouldn't be CEO if he wasn't an optimist. And he's not the CISO who's probably a pessimist. Are you an optimist? Yeah, I'm an optimist. Um, so uh, he's somewhere in the middle. And they have to have an even hand about it. So. What should that general counsel CISO relationship look like? A good one. Oh, boy. Um, it should be uh, you know, frequent reviews and, and frequent uh, risk assessment, risk, risk questions. The CISO presents budget, gets it all checked out by the GC. Yeah, we're going to buy this product. We're going to implement it here over this period of time, and we expect this result on the other side. I think the GC can, is certainly capable enough to, to make that decision if that's a good investment or not. In fact, I would hope the, the, the CEO or the board would, say, would turn to them and say, have you assessed this? You always want a third party. And you might use an outsider, but that that should be a it should be a frequent you know look I'm going to take a risk. Who do you go talk to? You know you go talk to the GC, you go talk to the CEO. The CEO says yeah go do it, buddy. You know that's not cool. <laughs> uh, but the GC will say yeah maybe we ought to think about that. And I think that's the relationship. Anytime you're mucking around with the perimeter, reorganizing the digital infrastructure, you ought to. Stop and ask, what are the risks of doing that? And that's best in the GC's office, I think. How often is the GC playing that role? Probably not as often as they should. It's another risk. It's another whole technology they have to embody. Uh, there's the SEC with the stuff they talk about there. They have to become familiar with it. They'll use a lot of consultants for a while. What role should the government be playing when you're mentioning the SEC? Yeah, I think it's about compliance. There should be standards. There should be tests and standards. We have it in buildings, cars, airplanes, clothing, you name it, right? Flammable clothing, you know, bed spreads, whatever. There's all this stuff that the government has managed to force us into compliance. It's a, you know, and it works. It really works. This building is not going to burn down. So uh, I think we ought to do that in time. And that's the role of government. And of course, you know, well, I, I participated in. Uh, uh, some, when I was the chair of the NVCA, they brought us in, the cyber venture capitalist, and we tried to help them write some legislation, and it, it never got off the ground. And it was, they were so focused on forcing everybody to share, and that just, that was just not going to work. Just, it just didn't work. But I think there should be standards about products, there should be standards about routers, there should be standards about our, our PCs and stuff like that. They should be, you know, um, if you use a PC in an environment uh, where there's sensitive data, maybe it has no USB ports. That'd be a standard. If you go into the three-letter agencies, they've all been glued up. It's just Which light. is a very technical solution. Yeah, it worked, right? But that's a, that's a policy of the agency mm -hmm. to do that. And the government should be doing that in our, li in our cyber lives. H how does that happen? I mean, as a reporter, I covered at least three or four uh, congressional attempts to do that, probably circa, what, 2012, 11, something Yeah, that was about when like I was that. working on some stuff, yeah. What, it, it was not, that was not successful. They couldn't even get voluntary standards right. passed. Um, how would you actually get standards into action? 
there are a lot of forces against that. A lot of forces against it. There always are, whether it's... And a lot of them are companies, right? Yeah, well, that's what I mean. It's all the commercial sector. It's like, it's like the you know, oil industry and Derek, oil derrick safety and stuff like that. There's, there's all these competing forces. But I think leadership will just have to bite the bullet there and force a coming together of what those standards should be. Uh, you know, uh, we have all these electrical standards. You know, this, these plugs are built a certain way, and they've been... Why isn't that in cyber? Um, I think you just, you just... Either that or we just have to have enough things sort of cyber burn down, right? Where people, a lot of people get injured, either losing their money, losing their health care, I don't know. Yeah, those kinds of things will cause Congress to do things. But until then, maybe nothing happens, and it'll be up to each of our companies to have our own policies. But I think government has a role. Yeah, that's interesting. You talk about a big, a big incident where um, a lot of people lose money. Um, how well protected is the financial sector? It's sort of held up as the gold standard. Yeah. I think um, what, are, what are they doing right, and what are they doing wrong? Well, I, I think they're doing a lot right. It's quite good, these, uh, the financial guys. They, they have... I think they have more people in IT than they have other non-IT people. They have, they have whole armies of they cyber do. warriors. They have, you know, uh, JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley, they all have conferences here in the Silicon Valley. They come out and interview all the companies. They, serve, they come visit us. They want to know what we're working on and what we think is important. And then they go back and think about it. And they, sometimes they employ it. Sometimes they copy it. Uh, that's OK. Um, but they have the ability to do that because they have such financial margins and such profits and stuff. And they can hire the best and the smart people to do it. So they are very much the gold standard. Um, and they have architect, you know, like I said, the, this ring architecture, Bloomberg has that and a few others. It's very clever. Um, uh, you know, that I, they just have the ability and they attract the people and the salaries to do it. So uh, smart people solving hard problems. What are they doing wrong? I don't know, they're probably keeping it to themselves instead of sharing it with everybody because they do have best practices. They do know what they're doing. And they should be sharing that more than just taking. Similar question for the cybersecurity industry. What is it doing right and what is it doing wrong? <laughs> well, there's the private industry, 2,000 odd companies, and they're sort of the public guys, which are, I don't know, 50, 75 public companies in the cybersecurity industry. Um, I think we, we, um, we probably oversell the capability a little bit because you have to. Got to sell. Right? You have to fess up. Uh, we probably don't admit the problems as often as we should. Uh, I think that's true in any, anybody, you know, if, oh, well, you know, I, I didn't quite check that algorithm. We'll just let it go. Um, that probably happens more than we care to admit and even know. Um, so I think those are just human f people, human uh, foibles. I think we probably don't sit down with our ecosystem partners, the other people that we could mutually work with together to get a one plus one equals three. Uh, our little company was called the force multiplier because if we use other people's data to make our results better. And that, well, that doesn't happen enough. Uh, they call that sharing, not really, but it's actually cooperating uh, in using other people's information to get things done right. So it's a, it's you know, it's like venture capital. It's a competitive and cooperative, right? You're trying to get that deal, and once you get it, who are you going to call? So it's like cyber. As soon as I come up with a great solution, who am I going to call? Who am I going to bring with me to give the customer a better solution? Would it be helpful if, as you suggest, cybersecurity companies actually did, at some level, pool the threat data that yeah. they have? Yeah. What would that look like? It would be huge. Um, I think it would be great. I mean, you know, uh, there are publicly available threat information, uh, vulnerability information. We import all that into our stuff. Everybody does. But, but who's what, exporting it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, where do you put it? Do you put it? Sometimes it's reported back out, particularly if it's a product. But no, that would be great sharing, particularly the zero-day stuff, right? Yeah. You're looking for those patterns uh, that are going to cause you trouble. And I don't think you share it because, you know, um, let me put my cynical hat on for a minute. If I'm a car company and I find the problem and I solve it, 
but I know that threat is going to hit the other car companies. Are you sad about that? Yeah. How do I feel about that? So that's a cynical view. Could there, could there, you, you, you declared yourself not an optimist, so could there be <laughs> a situation where that actually happened? Because it seems like, as you described, now I'm not, I'm not suggesting that this is particularly doable from a corporate interest standpoint, but would it, would it actually solve a significant problem? Is there enough sort of unique resonant data among the companies that are, you know, their raison d'etre is yeah. to, to figure these issues out? Yeah, I gotta believe there is. I mean, out here in Silicon Valley, there's all these automated cars driving around with their little LIDARs and stuff. I mean, there's three or four different companies, GMs out here. Why don't they share some of that data? Why don't they share that learning that they're going on to make all cars safer? You know, we put seatbelts in all cars. Uh, why can't we do similarly? If we're going to have automated cars, automated driving, why don't we share the algorithms that really make them safe? I don't know. Okay, la last question. Last question. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, you are a longtime VC guy. You like elevator pitches, right? <laughs> um, so you're in the Short elevator. Short and sweet, yeah. With, with Jamie Dimon. What do you say? Say, hey, Jamie, uh, you, know, you run a great bank. What's your digital resilience score? And he'll say to me, what is that? And I'll say, can I buy you a cup of coffee? <laughs> and uh, I'll step off with him. No, seriously, I would, I would first of all compliment him on a great business and a very cyber secure business. But he knows he has issues. You know, um, um, I visited J.P. Morgan a few years ago. The, from my VC world, uh, there's a guy there, Larry Feinstein, who's a great guy, and he was very open. And Jamie Dimon, once a month, would sit down with his cyber teams and evaluate what's going on. The, the strategy, the architecture, the spend, whatever it was. Uh, now, there's a CEO who's involved and has been for many, many years. That's probably why they've not had a giant attack, because when the CEO pays attention, everybody else pays attention. So I would compliment him on that. And I would, so flattering the CEO is usually Always a good thing. Yeah, always a flattering the CEO, particularly Jamie Dimon. Um, <laughs> But I would, you know, I would say, but you know, nothing's perfect. And have you thought about Red Seal? And I would get into sales mode. But no, I would, I would what, say. What, what, what information would you want to impart on him so that he can take it forth and either protect his company better, or protect the financial system better? What, what? Well, they're doing a lot already with the FSI sacks and all that sort of stuff. I, I, would, I would just say, I, I'd probably ask him how often he meets with his most senior cyber people. Uh, how do they direct solutions to problems? And if they've got new business, it's interesting when they come out here to the Silicon Valley and they talk about their strategy, they're always talking about what they're going to do next year and the year after. And so I would ask him, uh, are, they, are they doing it all themselves or are they buying other people's products and how does all that mesh together? Because they can't do it all themselves. That's one thing the government's decided. They've come, they, you know, they set up offices. It took a long time. Actually. Yeah, it took them a long time, but the, we actually can do something pretty decent out here. And I would ask him how much, what's, what balance does he have between doing it himself and that? That would be a question I would want to know. That's not about cyber per se, but it's about his business. How does he, how does he make his investments in cyber? So, Great. Well, and tell him to promote Larry. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank and you so thank, much. And thank you all Thanks. for coming.